Hello friends, and welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. Last time, we examined the Eastern Palace, the game's first full-length dungeon. This time, we're combining the next two dungeons into one video. But as far as formatting goes, there's a reason for that. These two dungeons, the Desert Palace and the Tower of Hera, are essentially opposites from each other, but in a complementary sort of way. We'll get into that more in a moment, but of course, there's a few pre-dungeon things to do as usual. After getting the Pegasus Boots from Sahasrila, he'll mark on our map the location of the next two dungeons, as well as the Master Sword. Already this early on in the game, we can see the overworld design gating us in terms of progress. That is to say, the established dungeon order is in full gear here. The game is placing barriers in our way, which we need certain items to overcome, slowly unwinding the overworld to us as we make progress. In order to reach the Tower of Hera, which sits at the peak of Death Mountain, we need the power glove, the item found in the Desert Palace, to lift this rock. But to get into the Desert Palace, we need the Book of Mudora, and in order to get the book, we need the Pegasus Boots, which we can only get after finishing the Eastern Palace. You can technically walk up to the dungeon entrance earlier than that, but you just can't get in without that book. Remember in a previous video when I said that some dungeons feel like picking apart a tangled knot? That's what this particular part of the game as a larger whole feels like to me also, but on a larger scale. It's very metroidvania in a sense. Personally, I like this. We're still in the first act of the game, so to speak, so slowly unraveling the explorable space to us isn't a bad design idea, and it makes that sense of progression feel like an accomplishment in a way. We also get introduced to the dark world in a limited area, which is going to be important later on in the game. That said, there's also some optional stuff we can do between dungeons as well, such as collecting heart pieces. After getting the power glove, we can also get the flippers, upgraded shield, and magic boomerang, which are all worthwhile. With all of that out of the way, we should get into the dungeon design itself. So after praying at this altar and crossing through the dark world briefly, we can head into the dungeons. We're in for double dungeon duty today. The Desert Palace and Tower of Hera are both fairly short dungeons, but they nicely complement each other in terms of their design ideas. That is to say, they are basically polar opposites. I guess after both Hyrule Castle and the Eastern Palace both followed essentially the same design formula, but executed somewhat differently, they decided that the next two dungeons ought to shake things up a bit, and that is always welcome. In essence, the Desert Palace is a large, open sandbox. <laughs> while the Tower of Hera is basically one straight linear path up the tower. In a way, I guess this is like the two sections of the Eastern Palace, but expanded upon and separated into two distinct dungeons. Well, mostly of course. The Desert Palace also has a bit of a gauntlet leading up to the boss, like the Eastern Palace had, but it seems clear to me that the emphasis is more so on that first section, which is far more robust. Likewise, the Tower of Hera does have some branching paths and explorable areas early on, but again, the emphasis is on that linear progression upwards here. Now, we've already discussed the dungeon music in the last video, a track titled Lost Ancient Ruins, and these two dungeons also share that same piece, so we won't really get into it more aside from me saying that, boy, I like this song. 
But all right, let's look at the Desert Palace, our sandbox in more detail first, before we move on to the tower. It's really cool to me how much explorable open space you get in this dungeon right from the start. The Eastern Palace had a lot of room to move around, but you still needed to tread through a foyer and two hallways first to get there. Here it's right from the start. No foyer, the entrance takes you straight into the dungeon central room. This entire higher area is explorable right away, and already we're encountering some tougher enemy varieties. The Bemos here, our first encounter with one in the game, is invincible, so all you can do is avoid its laser beams. The Leavers will spawn out of the ground to attack and swarm you, and these guys, called Devilants, will burrow into the sand, pop out, and fire projectiles at you. Exploring around here, we have a lot of freedom. There are eight doors accessible right from the start, and only one of them is locked. But there are still some obstacles to bar our progress. For example, this room at the top left has the big chest, which contains the dungeon item. But the big key that you need to open it is behind that one locked door. You also have three exits to take you back out into the overworld, and a fourth entrance leading into the second half of the dungeon. But that entrance is blocked by rocks, requiring the dungeon item. So we've got that tangled knot structure that I mentioned way back in Jabu Jabu's belly. Most of the dungeon is accessible right from the start, but you've got to carefully find one end to start at, then crisscross around the dungeon and unravel your progress. Among these explorable areas we'll find the dungeon map in the northernmost room, a trap room with enemies and no reward next to it on the right, and this bemos room to the left of it with a small key. Spending the key earns us the compass and big key, which in turn earns us the power glove on the opposite end of the dungeon. I love this structure of dungeon. It feels open in how much room to operate and explore there is, but it has a somewhat defined sequence of events that you have to figure out by exploring. This many rooms accessible so suddenly may also feel like it could be overwhelming from a navigational standpoint, especially this early on in the game. But because they're all connected to one larger, memorable central room, it becomes very manageable to do. Fun even. Since everything converges off that central room, you're never really lost. You always know where you are in relation to the rest of the dungeon. Once you have the power glove, you can access the second part of the dungeon, which, like the final section of the last two dungeons, is just a straight shot towards the boss room. Nothing exceptional here, but I like that they ramp up the difficulty a bit. These floor tiles are basically a barrage of attacks that you have to defend yourself against. Avoiding Bemos while looking for a key in this room is a fair little challenge, and this torch lighting puzzle that moves the wall is kind of clever and caps the navigation off with a neat little spectacle. Torch lighting up until this point has been strictly for visibility, and while it's a well-known trope in Zelda nowadays, this was the first instance of it in the series being used for a puzzle like this. Zelda 1 and 2 who had no such torch lighting. Plus, the wall moving aside like this just looks cool, let's be honest. The Tower of Hera has a totally different setup, but it gracefully introduces to us some new mechanics right away. In particular, these little gem switches which control these color-coded retractable barriers. By default, this gem switch is colored red, essentially locking you into this part of the foyer at the start of the dungeon. It's only by hitting the switch that the blue barriers will retract into the ground, but the red barriers will rise up to take their place. It's a pretty simple dungeon mechanic in theory, but it gets used in some clever ways down the road. Still, we don't get some long-winded written text tutorial, just this simple matter of learning by doing. As for that more linear structure I mentioned, this foyer room is the only instance in the entire dungeon that we get any branching paths. The rest is simply room-to-room -room linearity. And and that's not a bad thing, by the way, just pointing out that it's different from the openness of the Desert Palace. There are simply far fewer options of places to visit here. We can get the map right away here, and we'll find three doors. The northern door is locked, but is a necessary detour if you want to avoid some backtracking later, since that leads to a basement room where the big key is hidden. The small key we need to access that door, meanwhile, is down the stairs behind 
the left door, while the right door will take us upstairs. Heading up the stairs, we'll get a series of room-to-room -room puzzles, which will make use of these floor tile switches, which will change the room layouts slightly by altering where the pits in the floor are, and more usage of these gem switches to alternate the red and blue barricades. Something I find neat is that there are usually multiple ways to get through these rooms, since a solution to the traversal can be found by using either the floor switches or the gem switches. It's a nice touch to give us different movement options. Another first for the series here is that sense of verticality. It's a concept I talked about a lot in my early dungeon videos for Ocarina of Time, but truth be told, the ideas have their origins here. Despite the game being 2D, they still have these rooms stacked on top of each other in universe. In the Eastern Palace, it was more of an illusion of depth, but it didn't matter for traversal aside from teasing you with rooms out of reach. Here though, if you fall through a pit in the floor, it will actually drop you in the room below. It's cool to see them play with this idea here this early on. You can fall all the way down from floor 5 to the basement for a secret fairy fountain, for example, and the dungeon item, the moon pearl, must be reached by jumping down to this platform from the room above. It's clever stuff. The enemy variety here also gets ramped up a bit, which I'm always happy to see. The difficulty curve up to this point has been handled masterfully in this game, with each dungeon so far introducing us to different enemy types. And again, they always introduce them in controlled settings. These Kodongos, which are totally not Dodongos, are first encountered here trapped in these little boxes, before you fight them freely later on upstairs. The same goes for the first mini Moldorms that you fight, which will be trapped behind these red blocks until you release it with the gem switch. Then you'll encounter more in this room, with one of them out and about freely, but the other two needing to be released. Then upstairs, they're all over the place. These hard hat beetles, who are frankly annoying, also get introduced to us in a similar way. I hate these guys, truth be told, they are such hit sponges, and the knockback both from getting hit as well as just hitting them is absurdly far. Between these guys and the bumpers we find around here, it can be a bit tricky at times to avoid falling down below. Overall though, it's neat to see this more linear approach to a dungeon in this game already. The previous dungeons have had essentially a linear segment to them at the end, but this gameplay structure makes up the vast majority of this place, and I'm cool with that. If every dungeon was this straightforward, I think I would take issue with it, but that's not the case here. A bit of a shakeup now and then is always good, and it's cool to see us getting one big open sandbox and then one straight ascent up a huge tower back to back like this. Of course, in either case, these dungeons are still dungeons, which means they end the same way. In the desert palace after moving this wall, and at the very top floor of the Tower of Hera. Either way, we'll find ourselves being confronted by the dungeon boss. All right, I hope you like worm enemies. First up in the Desert Palace, we have a trio of Lan Molas that serve as our dungeon boss. Simply avoid their attacks and hit them in the face to win. If I'm being honest, these guys are not my favorite boss fight. They aren't bad per se, but they do feel a bit generic and bland to me, which is too bad because the dungeon leading up to them is so great. Sandworm bosses are nothing new to us now, I guess, but this is the first time we had it in the series, and I guess later games just do it better. They're definitely more interesting than Zelda 1's Landmolas, I'll give them that, but they don't come off as all that aggressive to me. It just feels like they're jumping around doing their thing. It's also too bad because we don't get any dungeon item integration here. I mean, technically the bow was not mandatory for the last boss either, but at least it could be used to make the battle easier. I get that the power glove isn't necessarily an item with a lot of combat utility, so it gets used more to progress through the dungeon and overworld, but maybe as an alternative the Landmolas could have knocked heavy rocks down into the room, which when thrown would deal massive damage or even stun them and open them up to attack. Just an idea, but sadly, we don't get to see any implementation here of the dungeon item. Oh well. It also would have been cool to see the final Landmola change tactics or get more aggressive like the final Armos Knight, but that just doesn't happen. He gets a bit faster, but nothing like that last boss. It still just feels like he's doing his thing, until he dies. That 
that lack of item utility goes for Moldorm as well, the boss for the Tower of Hera. But the Moon Pearl would be even more difficult to integrate here. I'm not even sure how you could use it, short of just putting the fight in the Dark World, but that doesn't really affect the gameplay, I guess. The good news is that at least Moldorm does have to be fought in a pretty unique way. I mean, granted, it is still simply avoiding attacks and then hitting his weak spot, this time the tail rather than the head, but the fight actually plays out almost like a sumo match in a way. The arena has no walls around it, so if you're not careful, Moldorm will knock you off the platform and you'll land in the room downstairs. And here's one of my spicy hot Zelda takes. I love this fight. A lot of people find it annoying to get knocked down here and have to tread back upstairs, but I love that you have to be mindful of your space here. Avoiding his attacks isn't just about not taking damage anymore. It's about staying in the ring. Other battles will penalize you for getting hit with damage, but I'm the sort to stock up on fairies constantly, and with how easy a lot of these bosses are, it never really feels all that dangerous to me. But the threat of having to pause the battle altogether makes the stakes here so much higher for me. Of course, this could be my niche tastes coming into play here again. Maybe I just like the prospect of suffering too much. Though let's be honest, if that threat of falling wasn't there, this fight would frankly be super boring, especially right after the Lanmolas. In fact, the Link's Awakening version of Moldorm is essentially just that, and I find it so uninteresting. That one added element of danger is what makes this fight distinct, and for me, that makes up for the lack of dungeon item integration here. In both cases, once the bosses are defeated, we'll get our heart container, as usual, and be rewarded with the final two pendants of virtue, meaning we can finally obtain the Master Sword. But more on that next time. So those are the dungeons. Coming off the heels of the Eastern Palace, which had the perfect sense of navigation, it's cool to see these dungeons take on such different approaches. With the Desert Palace doubling down on open explorable space, and the Tower of Hera leaning right into that linear room-to-room -room progression. But before we wrap this up, a few more notes I have. I like that the entire dungeon layout for the Tower of Hera fits within the parameters of this being a real tower. It's really neat to see them committed to making it fit within a physical space like that, especially in a 2D game like this. Add in that real sense of verticality with the rooms being stacked like this, and you have a dungeon that really stands out nicely. The layout feels like it fits into the structure we see before going in. Future dungeons will borrow this element of falling to lower floors, but an enormous tower like this is the perfect place to introduce us to that idea, and it's done really well here. I love how many optional little paths and routes there are around this section of the Desert Palace. We have a set of objectives such as finding a key, then the big key, and then the power gloves, but there's all these little hallways that wind around in loops, or this room with multiple doors. Having multiple ways to reach your goals ensures that your players are more likely to find them by just exploring naturally. Although I kind of hate that this room near the top right of the map is just straight up a trap. If you wander in, the door will close behind you and you'll be forced to fight the baddies in here. It just feels kind of pointless to me. Maybe adding in one more locked door and putting a key in here would alleviate things a bit in that sense. Then you'd have two keys that could be obtained in any order in this section, giving a little bit more flexibility in terms of how you progress, while still having a fair amount of objectives. But that's not what we got. Instead, this room just exists. I hate it. Another note, the attacking floor tiles are super annoying, but not an outright sin, I guess. It just bothers me how a room with these will grind the pacing to a sudden halt while I stand in the corner and wait for them to just finish doing their thing, just so the door will open. I'd take a room full of proper enemies over these guys any day. Though it's still at a small scale, it's nice to see the power glove being used for dungeon progression in the Desert Palace, even if it is technically out Inside the dungeon, it is still part of the overall navigation here, though it would have been cool to see even more of this. The lack of proper item in the Tower of Hera would be a major point of contention for me if not for the fact that the dungeon has several built-in mechanics already that make the traversal interesting on its own, so I'm cool with that overall. The only item I can think of that would have fit here and made things even cooler would have been maybe the hookshot. If these gem switches controlled hook 
shot points that would need to be raised and lowered, lest you fall down into the room below, that could have made for some neat little challenges. Think of this room in the Water Temple from Ocarina of Time, for example. But that item will come later, and be put to good use. But still, even though it's lacking a proper item, the Moon Pearl will still be mandatory for the rest of the game, so that we can retain our shape in the Dark World. So I'm fine with it. Overall, the traversal here is still well designed enough for me to not be bothered by all of it. At least not too much. And one final nitpick that I was going to write here was that I'm not fond of the big keys placement in the Tower of Hera. It is pretty well the same complaint that I had in Twilight Princess's Temple of Time dungeon with its boss key. It's tucked out of the way in such a spot that could be very easy to miss. I personally have never had that issue, but I can imagine a newer player making it all the way up to the top of the dungeon and then having to backtrack for it. But then I realized while writing this that the actual boss door that you need the big key for is only on the third floor, just one floor up from the dungeon entrance, meaning you can't actually get very far without making that detour first. So geez, they thought of everything here. That critique isn't even valid. So overall, we have two very different but very well designed dungeons here. A great pair of follow-up dungeons after the fantastic Eastern Palace, and a fun way for the bulk of the game's first act to play out. While they aren't my favorite dungeons in the game, I still like them both quite a lot. Thank you all so much for watching. Before we end this off, I just wanted to say thank you to the lovely people who supported me on Patreon or here on YouTube as a channel member, including but not limited to Grey Mage, Brenda, Tetra, Callie, Gale, Hylian Wes, Justin, Clifford Longhead, Midnight, Naomi, and Bunny. Thank you all so much for the support and for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Bye bye.